Hello, a warm welcome to Crest BD's Bipolar Wellness Center webinar series. This webinar will provide you with a summary of current research evidence on the relationship between mood and quality of life, as well as pointing you to some tools and resources to help you optimally manage your mood. Hi, uh, my name is Stephen Barnes, and I'm actually an instructor at the, in the Department of Psychology here at UBC, and I'm also the uh, Crest BD uh, Network Deputy. Um, today I'm going to be talking about um, uh, the topic of mood and the relationship between mood and quality of life and bipolar disorder. I myself have bipolar disorder, and so um, the topic of mood is near and dear to me, as, as is true for anyone with bipolar disorder. Um, what we're going to focus on today is basically some, some strategies for improving your mood generally and also for minimizing uh, your risk of sliding into a depressive hypomanic or manic episode. So the webinar's focus is, is basically going to look at why mood is important to your quality of life. We're going to talk about definitions of what mood is and in relation to uh, what emotion is. Uh, we're going to talk about different ways you can take action to help improve your mood and to stabilize your mood. Um, and we're going to talk about mood and bipolar disorder in general. And at the end, we're going to conclude with some uh, overviews of, some, of various tools and resources that are available for helping you um, manage your mood. So why is mood so important to quality of life? Well, mood is fundamental to quality of life for people living with or without BD. Um, mood symptoms, uh, particularly the symptoms of depression, are a strong determinant of quality of life in people with BD. And learning to manage your mood states is one of the most powerful things you can do to optimize your quality, your health and quality of life. So what is mood? Um, Mood is a diffuse feeling state that lasts for a few hours or days. Uh, this contrasts to emotions, which are more, more immediate experiences. They normally have a particular target, like um, a particular person or a particular event that's occurring around you. And they're typically brief, much briefer than mood episodes. So we're talking about seconds or minutes as opposed to hours or days. There's different types of mood states in bipolar disorder, as, as you're probably well aware. Um, there's depression, uh, hypomania, and mania. And I'm just going to briefly talk uh, about each of those. Uh, so depression involves um, any one of a number of different symptoms. Um, it includes low mood and or feeling flat, that is anhedonia, the lack of emotion with respect to um, things that you used to find pleasurable. Uh, you can see changes in sleep, energy, concentration, and body weight. Uh, it can also be accompanied by feelings of worthlessness or guilt. In fact, I mean, for most people who have suffered from depression, they would typically say that that's one of the defining characteristics. Suicidal ideation, likewise, is also very common in depression. Depression is also sometimes accompanied by unrealistic beliefs and perceptions. And this is mostly in the most severe cases. So in severe cases of depression, you would tend to say that the person might have uh, psychotic elements. That is, they're not actually... They, don't, they no longer have a realistic view of the world and or uh, their beliefs are, are, are incorrect about the world. Uh, so to have a diagnosis of major depression, you, you typically have to have any one of these symptoms or other symptoms last at least two weeks. So this graph is basically showing you uh, fluctuations in mood, ranging from mania to severe depression and, in, and everything in between. And in the f first part of the graph, um, you, it's important to note that there, even in a normal individual, in a person who doesn't have BD, um, th there are normal fluctuations in mood. And so sh minor shifts in mood from either positive shifts or negative shifts are perfectly normal. It's the, it's the degree of, of mood shift that's actually the critical defining factor of a depression or a manic or hypomanic state. So in this graph, for example, at the very end, there is a, a a strong dip towards a severe depression. Mania, by contrast, is, um, is characterized by elevated or irritable mood and hyperactivity. Um, also increased self-esteem, racing thoughts, distractibility, um, often a decreased need for sleep and engaging in risky activities such as those involving money or sex. Um, 
as with depression, uh, there can be unrealistic beliefs and perceptions, in which case you would say that the person is having uh, psychotic elements to their mania. And uh, to, to have a diagnosis of mania, it has to usually last at least one week and be so severe that it affects normal functioning. So this is a continuation of the graph that you saw earlier, and it's basically now showing you a person who's had initially normal fluctuations in mood following by a severe depression, and then a, ret a brief return to normality following, following which they're now in a manic state. Hypomania, um, you can kind of think of hypomania as mania light. It includes all the same symptoms of, of mania, but it usually doesn't, isn't considered to cause significant lifestyle problems. In fact, quite to the contrary, the person experiencing hypomania might be actually quite productive while they're actually in a hypomanic state. Um, usually this lasts at least four days. The other defining characteristic of hypomania is that it's not generally considered, it's very rare for there to be a psychotic element to it. That is, the person is still pretty much in touch with reality while they're actually in this hypomanic state. So uh, again, returning to this graph, uh, we're now seeing that the person has actually gone from a, main, from a manic state back down into a, into a normal state, and now they're actually into, into a hypomanic state. And this graph as a whole is, 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 not un, is, is fairly typical of, of a pattern that you might see in BD. Uh, often the first episode is, is depression, and then uh, later episodes uh, involve oscillations between uh, mania and depression and or hypomania. So how can you take action uh, to help uh, with your BD and to improve your quality of life while you're living with BD? Well, there are three steps to minimizing downwards and upwards mood swings. The first is to monitor your mood and well-being daily for changes. Uh, the second is to watch for triggers. And the third is to watch for early warning signs and, and, and develop some plan and response if you are sliding into an episode. In terms of mood monitoring, there are many ways to do this, including uh, paper and pencil-based monitoring tools, um, computer-based monitoring tools, and there's also a variety of mobile apps. Uh, we'll, we'll be showcasing a few of these tools towards the end of this presentation. In general, what you want to do when you're mood monitoring is choose whatever way you find works best for you and, and that you can incorporate most easily into your everyday life. Um, people often worry about what is a normal mood versus what is an abnormal mood. A good way to know the difference is to see if you can change your mood. That is, if you're feeling a bit flat or depressed, see if you feel a bit better by doing something you would don't usually enjoy. For example, by watching a favorite TV show or a favorite funny movie. If, if your mood lifts after doing that, uh, that's probably a good sign and it's probably just a normal fluctuation in mood that you're experiencing. Um, similarly, if you're feeling particularly hap happy or excited or wor and then you're therefore worried that you might be in a manic or a hypomanic state, see if you can moderate that mood by taking a few minutes away from the, stimul the stimulation, from stimulation. So what you would do typically is sit down, read a book, um, stay away from um, e excessive noise and other activities. If you still remain high um, and you, you find you can't concentrate on what you're reading, that's probably a good indication that you might need extra help. In terms of triggers, there are lots of triggers that seem to be important for people with BD. Life events in general can be a major cause of severe mood changes in BD. Uh, but there are particular triggers that are, partic that are very common for people with BD. Um, one is a uh, change in season. So there are a proportion of people with bipolar disorder who are at increased risk of depression in the darker months of the year and uh, an increased risk of hypomania or mania uh, during the lighter months of the year, during the summer and spring. I myself usually have this sort of pattern of fluctuation where I'm more likely to see a depression occur in the winter months and more likely to see a hypomanic or manic episode during the summer months. Another trigger is changes in sleep patterns. Um, that is a uh, decreased sleep, maybe due to, due to some work demands or something else going on in your life, 
can sometimes cause an increased risk for hypomania or mania. So it's important to stay on top of your sleep patterns and, and try to make them as regular as possible. Also, an increased need for sleep, that is sleeping uh, an excessive amount, uh, is, is often an indication that you're, you might be sliding into depression. Some other triggers include changes at work. So both negative and positive events in the workplace or, or in school um, can be triggers for unsettling your mood. Relationship stress is often uh, a source of mood fluctuations as well. Uh, conflicts or fights within a relationship can often uh, be, can be stressful for anyone, and it can be particularly stressful for someone with bipolar disorder. Pregnancy and childbirth is a is a is a is a big trigger for people with bipolar disorder. It can be a trigger for depression in in normal individuals, um, and it it. It can certainly be a, a, a trigger for someone with bipolar disorder. And we're not just talking about uh, women, we're also talking about men as well. So fathers might, be, might go through some of the same changes that a mother might go through uh, if they have BD. In terms of um, triggers, another one, big one, is uh, suffering a grief, uh, grief episode or losing someone, a loved one. Uh, people with BD need to be particularly careful at, the, at these sorts of times. Uh, there's a difference between the normal process of grieving and something that lasts a bit longer and um, might be a sign of uh, a depressive episode. So it's important to stay in touch with your healthcare provider and or your, your support network during a period of grief or loss. Drugs and alcohol can sometimes trigger mood episodes. Um, in particular, uh, stimulant drugs, party drugs, such as um, amphetamine, methamphetamine, cocaine, um, ecstasy, uh, can sometimes trigger hypomanic or manic episodes in people with bipolar disorder. Likewise, alcohol is a, often a trigger for people with bipolar disorder. That is, drinking excessively can often bring about a, a depressive episode in people with bipolar disorder. This is something that I myself have trouble with. If I have more than two or three drinks in a night, I will often pay for it dearly uh, for the following few days. Um, and this isn't, in, in, this isn't in the form of a hangover. It's in the form of a depressive episode. Holidays can also be triggers for people with bipolar disorder. And they can be stressful times for even people without bipolar disorder. Uh, so again, it's important to be particularly careful and mindful of, of your mood during these, partic during these times of the year. So in short, what you want to do um, when you're watching out for triggers is basically watch out for particularly positive or negative life events and, and be mindful of your mood during those, those events. Life charting is a technique uh, that uh, some people with bipolar disorder use success successfully to actually help them spot um, what event life events are particularly likely to cause, uh, are particularly likely to trigger an episode for them. For example, in this graph, what you're seeing is on the top um, uh, 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 fluctuations between mania and depression for a particular individual. And on the bottom, you see that they've listed off the, the associated life events and the mood episodes and the treatments that they were taking um, as all in an effort to, to basically try to um, uh, chart the pattern that, that exists for them in their, in their mood and their life events. Uh, this is best done in collaboration with a, with a healthcare provider or social support person. Um, if you find that you're someone with BD who has a rapid cycling bipolar disorder, um, this might be a bit difficult for you to do um, across your entire lifespan, but, and you might uh, prefer to choose maybe just the, first, the, the last six months and do a, do a life chart for the, the last six months of your life. So you also want to be watching for early warning signs. Uh, people who can recognize the early signs of mood episodes and who respond in a timely or helpful, positive way have a better course of bipolar disorder in general. There are many early warning signs, and there's growing evidence that there are particular prodromes that often occur in the early stages of extreme mood shifts. 
Some common early warning signs for depression include uh, feelings of low energy, feeling tired, having difficulty uh, concentrating when doing work or reading, um, having intrusive negative thoughts, um, so unwanted thoughts that keep coming back about particular, particularly negative things, um, the desire to be alone and away from people, um, feeling irritable with people around you, um, maybe sleeping too much or too little, also feeling sad or wanting to cry. Uh, in addition, feeling flat uh, or as which, and feeling anxious or feeling guilty. Some common early warning signs for hypomania or mania include feeling emotionally high, um, ideas flowing too fast, senses seeming sharper, colors seeming brighter. So for some individuals with bipolar disorder, there's, they actually report that uh, when they're entering a hypomanic or manic state, that the, the, the colors actually seem more vivid to them. Um, feeling especially creative um, and, and or being especially creative. Feeling irritable, um, again, uh, is also a sign of hypomania or mania, potentially. Um, an increased interest in sexual behavior um, and difficulties falling asleep. Um, in addition, feeling self-important and making lots of plans. Uh, so, for example, I often, for one of the early warning signs that I often experience when I'm slipping into hypomania is this sense that I can come up with uh, relatively grandiose theories about various things uh, related to either academically related or, or about the world as, as a whole. So there's a variety of ways that you can um, learn to spot the early warning signs uh, of, your, of your mood episodes. And one particularly useful ec exercise that many people find, you, um, to be va find to be valuable is so-called card sorting exercise. And in the card sorting exercise, which you can do in collaboration with a healthcare provider or a, um, a support, support person, what you do is you take a large sheet of paper and you basically write down all those things that you recognize as being warning signs of a mood episode for you. And you, you separate them into warning signs for depression and warning signs for hypomania or mania. And then once you have those on those large sheets of paper, what you then do is you, you sort them into cards. Okay, so you would write the, each of those mood up, each of those triggers, or sorry, warning signs onto, um, categorize them either as early, middle, or late. The early warning signs are the ones that you want to pay particular attention to because they might be useful for you to spot and potentially avert a mood episode. The late warning signs are the ones that are so close to the, the onset of the mood episode or actually are the mood episode that it's very unlikely that you'll be able to do anything at that point. Once you have your stack of early warning signs, uh, some people like to actually create a card or um, a file or something on their, on their smartphone that they carry around with them and it actually serves as a, as a touchstone that they can use to um, check in and see if they're actually experiencing some of their early warning signs. Um, in terms of managing mood and bipolar disorder, you really have to um, recognize that how we think and behave can have a big impact on our mood. So mood, um, unfortunately, mood is very difficult to change, but we, there are methods of changing the way that we can think about things, and also we can change our behaviors. And this is actually one of the central tenets of cognitive therapies for cognitive behavioral therapies for BD. That is, rather than trying to change the mood episode, you try to change your thinking patterns or you try, try to change your behaviors. Um, one thing that helps uh, mod modify mood is by, modify, by modifying your behavior. And one way of doing that is to try activity scheduling, where you actually pre-plan your week's activities hour by hour for each waking hour of the day. Okay, so this uh, sheet, for example, is showing you um, what you might do for an, an, an activity schedule and also allows you the possibility of, of rating the, the amount of depress depressive symptoms or pleasure that you're actually experiencing following each activity and whether or not you achieved what you set out to do.
in, in dealing with depression, you want to watch out for depressive thinking patterns. Okay, So there's a large number of different sorts of thinking patterns that accompany depression. One type of thinking pattern that, that often accompanies depression is all or nothing thinking or perfectionistic thinking. This refers to thinking about things at their extremes, thinking that things are either good or bad um, or, um, and no, nowhere in between. So, for example, if you, didn't, if you applied for a job and you didn't get that job, um, it, that, that you basically come to the conclusion in your mind that you're hopeless and you'll never get a job. That's an example of all or nothing thinking. Um, you have to realize and reframe that and, and say to yourself something to the effect that most people have to apply for a number of jobs before they actually get one. And not getting this, this one job is not an indication of my worth. Okay. Another type of depressive thinking pattern that people often slip into is catastrophizing or fortune telling. Um, these are thoughts that can basically um, take on uh, their own momentum and can snowball. That is, they can have imagined negative impacts and can grow quickly and, and, and lead to you feeling out of, con out of control. So, for example, um, if you had a particular uh, encounter with your loved one in the morning and they seem particularly distant, um, you could catastrophize on that and basically say, uh, they're upset with me, they hate me. Um, you, you would basically be doing fortune telling by, 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 by doing that. And then you, you would have to reframe that again and basically ask yourself the question, how do I really know that uh, they, they are angry at me or that they hate me? Um, it could be the case that they have something on their mind, they have some big thing at work today and that they're worried about that and that's actually re being reflected in their behavior. Um, another thing to uh, watch out for in terms of depressive thinking patterns is mind reading. Uh, mind reading is basically the belief that you know what other people are thinking. Okay, So for example, um, I often find when, when I'm in a depressive episode that if I'm attending a meeting um, and I see people, um, uh, let, for example, if I saw two people uh, chuckling amongst themselves and looking at me, I might come to the conclusion that they, they're they laughing about me. That would be an example of mind reading. Um, when in fact, uh, I should be trying to reframe that and basically asking the question, well, they must be thinking about something funny and they're talking about something funny and they want to share it with me. That's why they're looking at me. And maybe I'll check in with them afterwards and see what they were thinking about. Okay. Um, another depressive thinking pattern to watch out for is overgeneralizing. And this is a type of thinking when you, where you basically believe that something bad will always occur based on some previous unpleasant experience. Okay. Um, so, for example, if you took a course um, in, 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 let's say, in university and you did particularly poor at it, you then come to the, you overgeneralize and conclude that you're going to do poorly in every course that you subsequently take. Okay, it would be wrong and incorrect to, to assume that because there are so many factors that can contribute to why you perform particularly poorly in a course. Some other things might be going on in your life at that time. Maybe the teacher was, was not particularly good, not, wasn't, wasn't a particularly good one. And so it's important to try to reframe these things at all times and question your thinking. And it's particularly important to question your thinking before you before you can before you act uh, when you're in a, a potential hypomanic or manic mood. Okay, um, a manic mood. Um, so, for example, when you're in a manic mood, you might have thoughts that are particularly related to sexuality. You might be thinking things like, "I'm particularly sexy." Um, everyone thinks I'm sexy. Oh, my my work partner um, has a crush on me. Um, and then you should stop and. Th think and, and check, check the evidence with yourself. Basically, there's, there's something called the 48-hour rule. If you're planning to act on some thoughts that you've been having, you give yourself about 48 hours to, 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 to mull it over and to ch check, uh, check what the evidence is for the, for the decision that you're about to make. Okay? Uh, asking questions like, is it possible that my coworker was just being friendly rather than, sh than expressing some uh, sexual attraction towards me? Things like that. 
it's important to have a plan if the mood episode gets serious. And this is something that you can uh, help, uh, you can potentially come up with with, with, a, with, a, with a healthcare provider or with someone uh, who, who helps you with your mood episodes. Um, and so you, basically what you should do, you should have a plan to, as to what you should do if, you, if your mood episodes get full blown. Uh, if you get go into full-blown mania, what you should basically have instructions as to what your family members or loved ones should do, um, and you should. And what what you see on this slide here is basically an example of an action plan uh, for relapse prevention. Uh, so what what would happen on on the left hand side if someone goes into a full-blown manic episode, and on the right hand side if someone goes into a full-blown depressive episode. And you basically itemize with your family members what, what should be done under, under each circumstance. So we're going to talk about tools and resources. Um, and uh, there's a number of tools out there to help you with manage your mood. Um, one great sort, sort of tool to help you um, monitor your mood is, is basically good old-fashioned paper and pencil tools. Um, this is an, there's many of these available on the internet that you can print off and use to actually rate your mood on, on a day-to-day -day basis. So you basically look at um, uh, each day you basically rate your mood from more manic to more depressed or somewhere in between. And you keep track of that. And then you look at that with your healthcare provider when you, when you meet with them. There's lots of tools out there that are uh, available on the internet that allow you to actually track your mood online. Um, so for example, this is a, a wellness tracker that's actually available uh, through the uh, DBSA website. Um, uh, the URL for that tracker is at the very bottom of this slide. Uh, it's, a, it's a great wellness tracker and actually allows you to, to monitor your mood quite effectively and keep track of that. There's lots of mobile apps, both for um, Android-based phones and, and Apple phones. Um, uh, th these are three examples that are available. Out, one's called iMood Journal. The other one's called eMoods. The other one's called T-True Tracker. In all cases, what they allow you to do is basically rate, rate your mood on a da daily basis. A lot of people find these mobile app tools quite useful because they're easy to to, to transport with you, and they're always at your fingertips. So you can, you can, you, you can do a better job of, of actually making sure that you monitor your mood on a regular basis. Um, in terms of resources, you also want to identify early warning signs of mania. Um, so there's basically... Um, uh, various re paper and pencil resources available that will allow you to actually uh, write out and, and when, you, when you think you're actually mildly depressed or moderately depressed or, or have signs of mania or hypomania. Again, the, this, um, this, this, particular, this particular early warning sign worksheet is available at the URL at the bottom of the slide. So for more information and resources, uh, you can visit our, uh, the Crest BD Bipolar Wellness Center at bdwellness.com. Um, and to assess your quality of life, we have a quality of life tool available at bdqol.com. Uh, both are great resources that, that we've recently developed and uh, in, in collaboration with a large number of individuals, uh, including people with bipolar disorder, like myself. I just wanted to uh, thank uh, our, our, our funders uh, the, for, the, for Crest BD in general. Uh, so we received funding from the University of British Columbia, from the Canadian Network for Mood and Anxiety Treatments, from the Canadian Institutes for Health Research, um, uh, from the UBC Department of Psychiatry, and from the Mood Disorders Association of Ontario. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen to this webinar. Thank you, Dr. Bond, for, for that webinar. It's now time for the question and answer.
Um, the first of them, Dr. Barnes, is uh, how do you personally manage your mood in the face of all of your work-related responsibilities? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, one thing I, I emphasize personally in terms of managing my own mood is, is um, making sure that um, I have regular sleep and that I follow a regular sleep pattern. Um, that's very, very important for me. I find that if I uh, deviate from having regular sleep that I, I increase the likelihood that I'll actually have um, changes in mood. Um, sometimes I find that medication adjustments are necessary um, f given my schedule. So if I'm approaching a particularly busy period um, in terms of teaching load or workload, um, I might make uh, alterations to my med medications and you know in collaboration with my healthcare provider. Um, avoiding alcohol and drugs is very important, especially when I have something important um, on my schedule um, for in the in the coming days. I don't want to be messing around with alcohol because alcohol, for me at least, um, leaves leaves me in a depressive state in many cases and. Uh, Anxiety is a big component for anyone with BD. Um, we all wrestle with anxiety issues, and many of us do at least, and um, I find for me personally that um, keeping that anxiety in check is one way of keeping that anxiety in check is to actually uh, take, uh, take naps, in fact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the evidence yeah. tells us that about 80% of people with bipolar disorder have some kind of uh, significant anxiety at the same time to deal with. So it's certainly yeah. something that's important for our attention. Uh, the next question is asking you to drive down a little deeper into um, the specific difference between hypomania and mania. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so th it's, th the difference is somewhat ill-defined, and it's probably better to think of mania and hypomania as lying on, on somewhat of a continuum. Um, mania clearly involves behavior that could be called or typified as uh, being psychotic in the sense that the person has lost touch with reality. Um, it can be very um, so-called so in, in, insidious in the sense that uh, a, hypomania, a hypomanic episode can bleed into a manic episode almost imperceptibly uh, to the person who is experiencing it. And so that's why actually having hypomanic episodes can can Although it has its advantages, it also has its disadvantages in the sense that you can quickly lose touch with reality and, and end up being in a manic episode. Um, in general, it's always good to have someone to reality check with, um, and if you're in a hypomanic state, um, that's a particularly good time to be reality checking with someone you trust. Mm. Thank you. And the next question is asking you, um, what happens if you don't manage your moods, if you don't keep them under control? Um, well, the, the, the research suggests that if, if you leave your moods un uncontrolled, that some people with BD will actually get more severe mood symptoms and, and or more frequent oscillations between their mood states. Um, with hypomania, it's particularly tricky because it is so tempting to actually allow yourself to go into a hypomanic state. Uh, that's because there's, in that case, unlike depression, there are some pros to being in a hypomanic state because on the one hand your productivity is increased and your mood is elevated, um, but you have to remember that on the other hand uh, there are some cons and the, those cons include the fact that research suggests that this may predispose you to more frequent mood episodes in the future and more severe mood episodes. And as I said earlier, um, a hypomanic episode could easily or readily bleed into a manic episode. Um, you spoke about some of the resources for helping people to monitor their mood that are available in the Bipolar Wellness Center, both paper and pencil and app-based versions, but this question is asking you about uh, what specific methods you use and find useful. Um, yeah, it's a good question. So when, when I think I'm going into, into a depression, I usually make an effort to lighten my schedule for the ensuing week. Um, that's obviously not possible for everyone, but um, given my, my particular work setting, I am able to, to lighten my load, potentially, if I find that I'm slipping into a depression. 
And then what I do is I replace that time that I would have otherwise been spent in meetings or teaching or, or work-related stuff um, with a greater amount of cardiovascular exercise. I find that exercise for me, in particular for me swimming, um, does, does a lot to do to prevent me from slipping further into a, dep into a deeper depression. Um, when I think I'm going into a mania or hypomania, I, I will often ask others um, if I'm behaving differently. So I might ask my partner, for example, if I'm talking faster than usual or if I'm uh, acting a bit more excited than usual. And then in collaboration with them, I would try to assess um, what, if anything, has changed. Um, that is, if there's a trigger, potent a potential trigger that might have actually initiated that hypomanic or manic episode. Usually I find there is something and it's a matter of then um, uh, making adjustments to my life to, to remove or avoid that triggering stimulus. Mm -hmm. um, I'm particularly, um, I, I want to point out that that one great thing that, that Crest BD has actually done now is in the Bipolar Wellness Center there's actually quite a few tools there to help with mood monitoring. We went through some of them in the webinar but um, the URLs and the links to those are all available in the Bipolar Wellness Center. Mm. Thank you. you meant, sorry, go on. No, no, that's, that, that was you, it. <laughs> you mentioned in your answer there that uh, a couple of times that you rely quite heavily on a family member in terms of testing out where your mood is at and getting some perhaps more objective or another person's feedback. I'm just wondering if you um, relay that information to your healthcare providers that you work with in any way. Uh, yes, yes, I do. So if 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 my partner, for example, identifies the fact that I am in entering a a, a, a deep depressive state, or if I am slipping into mania, I would um, I would either contact my healthcare provider, and I've also given uh, my partner permission to contact my healthcare provider in in such instances. Mm, so that's, I guess, an instance of the having a plan in place for when exactly. you are going into a more severe episode. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay. Um, the next question we had is also about, um, you know, your personal experiences and asking you specifically about what your triggers are for mood episodes. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, for me personally, I find um, that interpersonal stress, um, either at work or in my personal relationships, is is a typical reliable trigger for me for depression. Um, if the trigger I find, and, and what I do about that is basically if, I, if there is some interpersonal stressor that's actually occurred um, and it's due to some interaction with an individual or, or, or two, I make a point of actually approaching the person and asking about that interaction and then telling them how it made me feel. Um, even if their response is negative, it is usually better to know the truth about the interaction than to um, spend time over interpreting things or mind reading. Um, I, in most cases, when, I, when I've done this, when I've actually approached the person and asked them, um, were you thinking this uh, or did you mean this when you said this to me, they actually appreciate the fact that, that I'm checking in with them because it actually shows that I care what they think and, and I don't think people should be shy about asking um, for that kind of um, affirmation. Um, the other trigger for me is um, a trigger, for, a reliable trigger for me is alcohol so having more than a few drinks in a night is, is, is a reliable trigger for depression for me. Um, often uh, if I make changes in, in medication levels um, um, either of my own volition or usually do in collaboration with my healthcare provider that usually has some sequelae in the sense that uh, it could trigger a hypomanic or depressive episode for me. Thank you for so that, that question. That becomes the time of extra careful mood monitoring for you? Exactly, yeah. Mm, okay. What I think is the final question for us at this point isn't about mood per se, but about personality types. It asks about the connection between different personality types and bipolar disorder. I'm wondering if you can comment on that. Uh, sure, yeah. So uh, there is some, some evidence to say that um, people with bipolar disorder um, tend to have a background personality that tends to be more, uh, more prone to openness or extroversion. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's as much as I know about that topic.
Yeah, and to end, the, um, there's a difference, of course, between personality types or, or traits and personality yeah. disorders, and there's quite a rich literature um, on, on the difference between the two and how they can be connected with bipolar disorder. Yeah, that's right. Um, that was um, an excellent question and answer session. Thank you for everybody on the line who posed uh, such thoughtful questions for us. Thank you, Dr. Bond, for joining us, um, and thank you uh, collectively to the Crest BD team who've uh, worked hard to bring the first of these webinars to fruition. And thank you most of all to all the participants who joined us today. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Bye-bye. Goodbye.